Hello, it's Wednesday morning, and it's time for more relaxing painting with Dyson Dungeons. So, let's see what we're going to relax on today. Uh, we have a whole kind of eclectic mix of things today. Um, I, um, I started doing gray base coat. And it's like a color for our dungeon sets. And I got uh, like six tiles done with the base coat um, looking at this. And, you know, they need touch up just like the blue ones did. But I've got a whole pile more to base coat. So I'm going to have to try to work on the timing for that. Uh, the other thing is that at the uh, on, on Monday, I started painting the door frames for the uh, blue dungeon sets that I had already oh, <clears throat> base coated and washed and uh, received the executive decision that all the door frames and all the sets will be um, basically the same color uh, grouping as the floors and walls in our stucco sets. So that's a flat earth based coat and then a smoky ink wash. And I might be doing some of that like pretty early on here um, to get that going. Probably not the first thing. It might be the second thing because maybe the first thing I need to do is remember what I was talking about. Um, oh, you need to be careful with the wash because sometimes you want all of these things to look you know, more or less uh, uniform so that you could put them all together. Well, in this particular tile, there's one of them. Uh, the floor came out very noticeably darker. For some reason unknown, the wall looks okay. When you compare the walls, they came out pretty well. But that, but this particular floor, uh, maybe because I did it twice, this might have been the test one, I'm not sure. But what I need to do is repaint the base coat on this and then rewash it. I've got scarcely any of this blue paint left, so I'm going to scarcely use it to repaint the tops of the floors. More is coming. There'll be more here probably in a couple of days, but uh, this one just really stood out amongst my friends. So I'm going to repaint the base coat on this using the bits that are left in here. And then rewash it. See the dramatic difference uh, between the base coated and washed bits and the new the new base coat. So I'm doing this first because I want it to dry, uh, and it takes a while for that to happen. So that if I remember, remembering thing, get the. So this base coat, um, you know, it's not perfect, but it'll. It'll put it back to its original color. The little indentations are staying dark, but that's just fine. We kind of want that look. So you saw the difference between a um, too heavily washed floor. There's the difference between a washed floor done right and an unwashed floor. So we're going to set these aside here. looking for the aside. Yep, this will be the aside. And I'm going to start working on gray base coating. Things that I've done need touching up. So those will be the first to be touched up when it comes time to be touching up. I'm going to just leave those there 
so they're not in the way. And these others move closer to me so that as I base coat them, they will be stepped to the side here. And hopefully those will dry off enough um, so that I can do the touch up on those yet today. And after I get the great base coats done on all of these, then I will uh, do the washing on the door frames that I had painted last time. And then I will go back to touching up uh, these gray rough stones. You might notice that this one is sort of sitting out. Uh, we have two, we actually have three different levels of black wash, blackish wash. There's black, this is dark gray, and this is light gray. And I just, I wanted to see what would happen. You can basically not see the light gray. I mean, if you, if you compare it to the unpainted and the right light, you can tell that there's a little bit of uh, pigment on it, but I just wanted to make sure that I was going to be using the correct wash when the time came. So, having put some test wash on these, basically these two floor bits and this wall, um, I need to be base coated. So that's one of the bits over here with the to be done pile. So, that's what we'll be doing. Relaxing painting today is uh, fixing one of the tiles out of the whole group that I washed before that got too dark. Base coating this set, which you might recognize as the Necromancy layer uh, in gray, because that's one of our alternative colors. Finishing up the door frames and then doing a whole lot of touch up on the base gray, okay? And then I look to my left and there are many pieces that Nikki primed yesterday that will be base coated. Looks like the, the stone is going to be in blue. And then there's a good number of wood tiles, especially floors with, without walls um, that will be done in our uh, flat brown smoky ink combination. So, I managed to chat for like 15 minutes. Hi, Ophala. How you doing okay today? Um, I will do a flip for you after I mix this gray paint because it really badly settled last time. Pretty boring, but I need to make sure this paint is thoroughly mixed. It was uh, a fairly new bottle, and the pigment had all settled way down. So when I first used it, it was just awful. Mainly just so. I can see that no matter how carefully I base coated in gray, it has the same sort of issues that. Um, the blue did, which is that there's little spots that didn't get covered, little gaps down, if you can really see it, there's a little white spot down there, um, where either the paint didn't go initially, oh, there's a lot of them there, so I'll have to push the paint down in those crevices a little bit harder, maybe use more on the brush. Um, the paint didn't go, or when it tried, it shrunk and pulled away. Well, good morning. Thank you for joining us. First time in chat. Um, yeah. Well, since you just joined us, I'm going to recap what we're doing today. 
uh, working on dungeon tiles. The dungeon tiles are all printed on these 3D printers behind us. I think it's done in PLA. Then we airbrush prime them and then base coat and wash and they form all sorts of little dungeons, some of which you'll see under me on the screen. Um, and so what I'm doing today is putting a base coat on a whole lot of these to turn them gray before they are washed to make them look much more realistic and lifelike. And I'm also uh, working on some door frames from a set that was done before. The, the door frame here. And this has already been completed and washed, but the door frames needed to be painted wood. And that, you know, it's brown like wood, but we we washed that as well, and it really pops out. So we'll be seeing that a little bit later. But having fun mixing paint. So I'm going to put on a couple of gloves because when I base coat these, we've got these wonderful little handle things with the sticky tack on top, which are great for minifigs because you can move them all around. But these tiles are a little heavy for that. And the way the tiles work, these are really cool. They're uh, 3D printed. This is actually all one piece, this whole thing. And then ball magnets are put in and the base is attached so that one can put them together in any configuration or reconfiguration that you would want. You don't need any special, yeah, it's really neat. Um, so you don't need any real, you don't need a special base and you can put them on any surface and reconfigure them. We've actually, in our D&D &D campaign, the DM has, yeah, they're little ball magnets that go, you can't see them because they're under this base, but there's uh, a couple on each side and they hold it together. Yeah, I can show you. These are the ones I base coated. They need touching. You can see how, sort of how this can work. Put one together there. That's an inside corner. Yeah. There you go. All of a sudden you get a, uh, like a walkway into a little area here. And when you get more of them, you can build some uh, pretty elaborate sets. So we're, we have, you know, there's up there is a tavern. We can see what that would look like. Uh, some necromancy layers are kind of scrolled through as well. But yeah, so these are all 3D printed here. Um, we don't make our own magnets. Yeah. Green Bay Packers not having the best. Yeah, you can. You can make the walls move in game. Our DM decided that uh, we would go into a mimic dungeon. Basically, it was uh, you. Change, we attacked the power source, and when the power source was destroyed, the dungeon came apart. And. Got reconfigured. Yeah, so very quickly you can, if you you know know what you want to have happen, you can reconfigure the uh, the entire set as you're playing, um, and they uh, they fold together really well, you know, so you don't have to worry about them all falling apart. So there's uh, you know there's corners, walls, inside corners. These doorways. This, this is a different color combination, but you can see how that would work. And the doors, I think we've got a sample here. These are really cool. The doors go in, pin hinged, and they operate. This one doesn't, this is not hinged yet. 
but uh, you can open and close them during the campaign so you get up to a door okay and the door is locked and your rope picks the lock and it opens and something either good or bad happens so this goes on top and then a lintel goes across to hold it all in place so it's really cool and then um each of the dungeon sets actually also i mean it's not just the walls and the floors but a lot of them come with uh, somebody calls them scattered but they're little they're special pieces extra pieces that um, are used like in one of our sets there's a brazier it's one of the floor tiles okay these don't match exactly but i'll show you how they work so there's a brazier and the wizard the fire wizard says their magic words flame on or whatever and uh you get the flame it goes there and now you've got and that's magnetized too there's a magnet that holds that in place and so now there is a flame in the brazier or you know if it's if they're doing water elemental magic there would be like a fountain things of that sort so yeah we've got these really cool pieces accent pieces that work um, another one is there's a throne room which is over there i just finished it a while ago and up on a dais is a throne this is uh, the throne of somebody who's um oh i don't know like the dark stone anyway that came out pretty well and if you watch our dnd campaign you know that there are such things as fervent crystals which are a real power source and those sometimes show up too okay So that's how that all works. Um, and there are, I think we're, I think there's six, I think there's six different sets that we've been working on, plus um, just extra pieces, you know, just extra walls and floors that you can use to change or expand the sets. So it's a really, I mean, if you want something there are, I know that there are dungeon tiles out there, but uh, we think that these are pretty spectacular just in terms of, you know, the quality. This is one solid piece, except all except the little plate on the base. So if you drop it, the wall doesn't fall off. Uh, you can't really, you can break them, but you'd have to use a hammer. Um, and the, the, magnet, the magnet part, it's uh, really pretty neat. But I guess I need to paint because that's what this show's about. Relaxing painting. I'm going to be relaxing by putting a whole lot of gray paint on the hole on the top. And then moving them off camera to my right, where they will wait for touching up. Um, this one just needs to be repainted because I had uh, tried some different washes on it. But that's pretty straightforward and easy to do. Paint out and paint over the parts. Previously washed that we don't want washed yet. one this one was uh, an experiment that just a lighter gray wash than we've been using and the experiment failed it's the magic of paint to make the evidence of the failed experiment just simply disappear but the thing with these as you'll see when we touch up is to 
uh, get the paint down into all the mortar joints, basically. Oh, yeah, I forgot to do the flip. No, I've got a paint bottle cap here. I can flip this. Well, yeah. There we go, and we finally landed the other way. That's a tradition on the show, is to have a flip of something. So, yeah, I'm just starting by putting the paint down in here, trying to work it into these gaps down here. Definitely want it, the paint to be between the stones down more this way. The primer is a light color. Ships through later. Does the wash is just an ink, fairly transparent ink. Um, the lighter color will show through. It will ruin the effect. So, paint in here, and then on these walls, the the gaps. The mortar joints are actually pretty deep, and it's, uh, you know, not a nice smooth painting of the surface. It's like working paint down into surfaces like that one there that refuses to accept the paint. Because of the, the surface texture, I mean, it's not just the mortar joints but the texture of the box, which I, it's hard to see in, with the wash. You can start to see it, the gray paint. There's actually a lot of surface area, more than just if it were a smooth wall, so these suck up a fair amount of paint. Especially since you need to load the brush pretty heavily in order to get it to work down into the joints. After much failed experimentation, um, I found that since I have to hold this, I can't use the holder because it keeps falling off, which I discovered. Um, I'm not painting the bottom so I can safely hold it on the bottom the entire time. And then if I hold it on the top, I can set it down and paint one little fingerprint that, um, that's left. These curved balls are pretty cool. Little alcoves. In the throne room or in the, uh, the necromancy lair, there's a uh, coffin behind a couple of these curtains. This is more of a sarcophagus. Wednesdays and Fridays, almost every Monday, Wednesday and Friday, taking off sometimes vacations or when there are appointments that we can't avoid, going to the dentist or something. Um, Mondays, Wednesdays and Fridays right now is from 10 until 2. Doing, it looks like from now until almost forever, it just feels that way. We'll be doing dungeon tiles until we complete at least one prototype, one actually production ready, we'll call it, production quality example of each of the sets. And with the stone sets, one in each of the base colors, either this light gray or their darker color, the blue that I 
had showed you earlier um, when I was showing you the door frames. Later this week, maybe as soon as Wednesday, maybe a little later than that, um, there's a whole lot more variety sitting over there on the having just been uh, prime pile. And so even though there's a lot of floors and walls, there's also pillars and other scatter and a bunch of doors and things, the painting will probably become a little more interesting. To move these way over to the side. And the ones that are furthest from me will be the ones I did first. So when I do the touch up, I need to remember to reach over and grab the ones that are furthest from me because they would have been done longest to go and are more likely to be dry. Those of you who are watching in chat, and in chat you can, I seem to forget that, which is possible. A little gentle reminder to take the ones that are furthest away would be good. Otherwise, yeah, just having tops and bottoms here. And be applying a good deal of gray paint to a good deal of surface area. Always the you know what there's music in the background at least there's supposed to be that helps for people who are just kind of lurking and watching and listening occasionally I'll try to keep up sort of a monologue about something next topics were the difference in perception of fractions and percentages. Really need to rotate this a lot to make sure I'm getting the surfaces colored. Oh, so what, where we have 20, 20 things, 20 tiles I was painting, and so we were counting down as we went, and so there'd be the, the question of things like, it feels like you're further along. Um, Seven twentieths. We decided that at least it seemed to me that something the the odd the fractions seven twentieths, which is thirty five percent. 720s just doesn't sound like much. It's really actually kind of an unpleasant sounding fraction, I think. But 35% makes it feel like you've made some progress. You get to things like 1720s. When you say 1720s, it's actually really a little bit hard to grasp how far along that is toward completion. You know that it's close to being done because 17 is pretty close to 20. But if you say 85%, then it's, oh yeah, okay, I know what that means. 85% means that you're, you know, really almost done. You're almost at 90%, which is like practically finished. Say 1920th, 
and you know that 19 is really close to 20. But it doesn't give you a real sense of how close you are to being completed, not, at least not in the same way that saying 95%. Do that sense. So it was, you know, it's kind of fun to think about not just the numbers, but the perception of numbers. Like the famous, and I think probably actually true story once before about uh, Burger King versus McDonald's. So McDonald's comes out with the quarter pounder. You know, which when you actually get one isn't all that much meat, but it's got the word pound in it, right? So quarter pounder, that sounds like it's a pretty hefty burger. But Burger King decided that they were going to compete and actually do a one-up on them. And they came out with the third, the third pounder, and they called it but it was a third pound. Then they did a taste test and people liked it. And, uh, taste test at least Burger claimed that it actually did better than the quarter. Probably because they, you know, the flame broil thing, they charred the beef a little bit. Um, and then they asked people, you know, would you buy it? Which one did you buy, the quarter pounder or, or this one? That's a third of a pound. And really quite a bit of difference in the amount of meat between a quarter pound and a third. But people said they would buy the quarter pounder, which didn't make any sense because they thought it tasted better and it had more meat. Turned out that um, it's only a third of a pound. This is a quarter of a pound. Or it's bigger than three. But there you go. So then another, the, the follow-up story I heard is that they're thinking of bringing the ad campaign back again, but they were going to call it the three ninths burger. Because their testing showed that, well, you know, nine is way bigger than four. They probably could sell more of them if they even called it the two ninths burger. Weirdness about the perception. And it's true, there are some numbers that are, they just look nice, you know, they're, they're kind of pretty to look at. And there are other numbers that are just not, and then people will prefer them. Um, I'm sure, you know, people who do marketing are really adept at exploiting that kind of thing. And I know people get really confused by percentages, not so much. I mean, people have a sense of, 20, you know, 25% versus, you know, 25% off is good, but 50% off is even better. is a confusing thing i think there you know I, I wouldn't be surprised if some people if you say you get this is 50 percent more thinks thinks that they're actually getting like double okay but you really need you know a hundred percent you know just double something and if you say 200 percent more that gets really confusing you know that that's that's more you know 200 percent more is more than a hundred percent more but you, I don't think people have a real grasp of what that means in terms of relative out. 
say triple well triple what you get people will immediately know that that's a lot really. well, if you say 200 percent more it doesn't sound quite as uh, like quite as good a deal <laughs> what numbers do i think look man kind of a I kind of like the rounding numbers. You know, five. Five is kind of a nice number. Eight. Eight is nice. If, if eight gets lazy and lays down, then it's infinity. That's kind of cool. Three comes up a lot in our lives for some reason. It comes up phone numbers and addresses and numbers, all sorts of things. I was always very good at being third place at a lot of stuff, especially in high school. So in some ways it's a very, you know, it's a, it's a number that just shows up all the time, but being third place all the time isn't all much, all that Great, so it doesn't have real positive associations. And what about you? Ah, threes and eights. Hmm. That is actually pretty pleasant to look at. I've got, you know, fours and sevens if you just ran that, that together. Hmm. Sharp points and things. Just probably wouldn't be uh, as relaxing or easy on the eyes. Yeah, see, it just, you're right. I mean, it just isn't quite the same. But I mean, there are some people who probably would prefer that. I mean, just aesthetically, they would they prefer the fours and sevens. I don't know, what do you think? <laughs> well, definitely, you know. What if you mix them? What if you put... Uh, Fives are kind of a mix of the two. Okay, what what does a whole series of random fives and sixes look like? Yeah, see those go together pretty well. Hmm. It's not bad. It's... When you run them all together like that, they're uh, really similar to each other. Okay. Recently, eights were really, were really kind of nice. Of course, if you were if you're artificial intelligence instead of like real intelligence, you probably just like ones and zeros, right? Yeah, everybody likes that number for for reasons. Corner of peace. I haven't done one of these in a while. And of course, some people would say, you know, just by definition, the best numbers are the ones that win the lottery, no matter what they are. 
Didn't somebody win like a billion dollars or something just a little while ago? Come on. If you pay it out over 40 years at least, if you take it all at once, I think it was like six or seven hundred million. I think, you know, most people can get by on that at least for a while. Even if you splurge, go out to dinner more than once a month. That kind of no. Yeah, those are those are classic combinations of letters. Thank you for becoming a follower. Much appreciated, as do all of the Dice and Dungeons folks. If you like what our what we're doing here, you I don't know, do you do you um, watch Dungeons and Dragons or play it at all? Because our what we started out as was um, running a campaign, D Dun Dyson, a Dungeons and Dragons campaign. It is still going on. And we stream it every Sunday. And um, this all started. These things all started because we wanted, you know, we wanted a really nice playing surface. We wanted to, to not just have uh, paper cutouts, you know, for our dungeons. And so one of our players got a 3D printer and started printing out these dungeon tiles. I think we started out with just like pillars, pillars and walls didn't even make full dungeons, they were just sort of scatter. Yeah, well, you know, if you want to check us out, it's Dyson Dungeons. We have episodes up on YouTube. We, um, there's three live players, and then occasionally our group is joined by a fourth kind of an NPC group member that the, our DM will throw in. Um, we have a common, we have a real eclectic kind of uh, show we do. There isn't a lot of combat in it. I mean, sometimes the com there, there will be combats, but it's not combat centric. Well, we do a lot of shopping. We do a lot of uh, of retail shopping at magic shops and things and uh, eating we've become uh, gourmet pretzel specialists kind of hard to explain but Someone actually had a real life experience once. And it might have been a pretzel shop. I'm trying to remember how it even got started. That um, as they were leaving the store, the clerk said, Have a pretzel day. And you go, What does that even mean? But once we heard about that, we had to incorporate it into the show. And so, whenever we visit a new town, or even a new like tavern or something, we always check to see if they have pretzels, and whether the pretzels are good enough to give us the experience of a pretzel day. We, we built D100. A d20 depending on the whims of the DM um, you know to see if we score a pretzel day or not anyway yeah there's a there's a fair amount of role-playing a lot of role-playing ourselves amongst ourselves at the DM as we go on various shopping adventures sometimes we go on cooking adventures one combat was actually, um, I guess I'll call it a combat. It was like that. It was uh, an omelet contest. 
you know, to win the omelet contest in order to acquire a particular magic item. One of our characters, Apollo, managed to win. So we, I think we spent. Anyway, it was it was very intense. We had to get, we had to find out, we had to do a lot of espionage to find out what the judge liked in an omelet. We found out that they liked the large omelets, that they hated grapes, um, and liked a particular kind of pepper, which was very hard to come by and was actually kept only by the person with against whom we were competing. Um, so then we had to find the ingredients, including the peppers. And in order to win the contest, it was important to not only work really hard to make the right omelet or the right size with the right ingredients, but, you know, it's, it's a competition, so you have to try to sabotage the, uh, the other person. The real effort to, of course, the, the person against him, we were competing for the magic spatula. Seriously, that's what we were fighting for, is a magic spatula that all you had to do was touch the thing on the griddle and it flipped it over perfectly every time. Um, but yeah, we had to uh, try to figure out how to get grapes into their omelet. And we succeeded at all of that. And of course the DM being diabolical, that's what the D is, I think. Made sure that the omelet that we had sabotaged was a uh, red herring. It was not made of red herring. I didn't put any red herring in the omelet. But, um, you know, that it was a decoy. So we had sabotaged the decoy omelet, whereas the real omelet was already prepared and on the table. Judge. Anyway, um, it was a very close competition. We just barely won. I know we needed that. It was like the DM does that. Probably, I would say almost every other episode is there's this throwaway. You know, you're walking through the kitchen and you see the cook flipping things with the spatula. It's a really amazing to watch. It's just everything is flipped it's perfectly every time. Well, you know, we were on a quest and we're supposed to be somebody or find an object or something, but you can't you can't see that without deciding that you have to have it. And even deciding how to get it was, you know, quite a thing. Do we try to steal it? Get it through ritual combat or whatever. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think we used up probably like three fourths of one of our sessions. But anyway, that's the kind of thing that happens. And then occasionally we get into mortal combat. Usually with some sort of very creative things, like a uh, fungus dragon. I'm not sure what it was, a spore dragon. It was a dragon that had a small one, like a wormling kind of dragon, not a big one. Because the DM doesn't let our characters level up. Um, yeah, so we're we're going through these caves and we meet this this dragon that had been infected by the spores of a poisonous plant and sprayed us with poisonous spores and things. It was, actually it was pretty gruesome. 
we ended up disabling it, basically forcing it to flee. We weren't able to kill it, but fortunately it wasn't able to kill us either. Though it came pretty close. Anyway, um, you might enjoy it. You know, if you if you pop onto YouTube you, and check out one of our episodes, oftentimes the title of the episode sort of gives away what kind of episode it is, whether it's a combat or an exploration, or whether we're just simply going through an endless cave. We did that. It was like this. This felt like endless cave. Anyway. Spending one day at a time with 300 changeling characters that we had just rescued and are trying to take to a safe place. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, we that was quite a challenge. We spent, I think, the in gameplay time probably. Um, 19 days, I think, going through this cave. You know, and there were things that needed to be done, like we had to figure out how to get through blocked passages or over large chasms or dealing with things like uh, spore dragons. But the main challenge was uh, we had no real food or water with us because we had just made an escape. We were running away. Yeah. Didn't, didn't have time to buy three weeks worth of provisions, much less carry them for 300 people. So that was kind of interesting. You know, just the, just the, the challenge of the logistics of getting through this place added to the finding our way through. Anyway, if you, if you have a chance, uh, go on YouTube and listen to a couple of older episodes. I, I think they are pretty entertaining. And that's what we try to do in our stream. It's not just playing the game, but it's we're trying to be entertaining as it's as we do it. Sometimes I have to admit uh, they're almost like inside jokes. There's you know references to things that happened in the past, and if you didn't have, if you hadn't been there for those older episodes, you know sometimes that it doesn't. I mean, if you had, it's hilarious, and if you hadn't, then you go. But that happens with any kind of series of things, doesn't it? Anyway, um, yeah, that spatula turned out to be pretty cool. It also turned out that um, every cook in town had like a half dozen of them. So we thought it was an amazingly rare and spectacular magic item, and it turned out that they were just everywhere. That we could have just gone to the bookware store, probably, and picked up three or four of them. But we didn't know that, so it was a whole, just a whole lot more fun. Well, let's say this is moving along fairly slowly. Done with this tile. I'm gonna cap up this bottle. It's been sitting here open for a while. And it's not that it's drying out, but that the pigment is starting to settle a little bit. And the stuff getting off the top is a little bit watery.
No, you know, the thing is, though, even after finding out how common these things were, we didn't we didn't look for we didn't look for a cookware store to buy more. It was like, oh, well, we won this thing through competition, so we'll treat it like a rare prize. We don't always make the uh, the most rational decisions, either in terms of economics or sometimes even in terms of our relationships with the other characters we run into. There is, though, nothing worse than going into a magic shop. So many things that one can get in a magic shop. And what to say the most fun in the magic shop is finding out what's in the bargain bin. You know, the cutout bin, or uh, things that have never been sold or lost their popularity, or excess inventory and things are they're just dumped in there. Pay at a discount. Being savvy shoppers, we you know we ask about items that we desperately kind of need, like maybe an upgrade to our armor. Ring of protection, that kind of thing. Um, but we never fail to examine the bargain bin. Back to what I'm painting here. Um, this particular thing is the gray version of the necromancy layer, which is a crypt. And it's been taken over by a necromancer and the special item besides just the sarcophagus that's in the corner is the pool. And I'll describe this when I do the base coat on it in just a couple minutes. Um, There's one underneath me. There's one with the blood pool. This is the thing that's in the center. This is a four by four tile, each little stone being uh, representing five feet. This is a pretty big one. And the story behind this is that my DM Alexis, who prints these things, thought, okay, you know, necromancer should have a, like a slime pool or something. Um, and the original model for this were, was actually four two by two tiles. That is, each tile was a quarter of this. You know, which in itself isn't all that bad, I guess, but we um, found this stuff called realistic water, which I think is just like a liquid plastic resin, and when it dries, which can take anywhere from one to four days, depending on how you use it, that was a thing we had to discover. Um, it dries, it gives that glossy surface that you look, that you saw um, when the, the pools came. And it does. 
it does look like water and uh, you can put cool things underneath like we've done some river tiles with you know blue and white and things underneath little rocks and stuff and then put the water over it but we said well this pool would look pretty nice if um if it were filled with a liquid like that if you've got four pieces there's these gaps right together and the realistic water would flow right through those make a mess of whatever it was sitting on but not it just wouldn't work very well and if you just push them together they you know they join up okay but it doesn't look like a single pool so that was quite a challenge so what we did with the very first prototype was we epoxied them together edges so that um, it would come apart and then use this the compound that modelers use you know, a plastic putty kind of thing to fill in the gaps and it mostly worked it was there was one little leak around the edge No matter how careful we were in terms of doing the filling in of the spots. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, so, yeah, we filled them in, and you could still see the seams, and also Alexis redesigned the entire thing. And printed this out as one big 4x4, four four, getting rid of the seams. Um, and introducing bubbles. So the way these are completed, it's kind of a cool thing, is that uh, they paint a base coat of a color in the pool. These are going to be done in green. and then put in a layer of this realistic water liquid plastic rosin stuff and uh, put drops of paint in there'd be light green and dark green and maybe even a yellow and a black and the, the paint two cool things happen is the paint diffuses through the, the plastic rosin just kind of spreads out in tendrils and also you get a you know special tool like a toothpick and spread it around and in fact we the first time we tried it we weren't sure sure how it was going to go at all we tested it you know this actually turned out to be one of the successful tests. We tested it in a bottle cap. Um, this is actually still the original bottle cap. So we base coated it originally in green, but then we did a red one. Just We did a green one and then we did a red one to see how it would look. Um, so it's base coated in red and then the liquid water is put in. You know, we used like a light orange and a dark red and a black. And you can see how it diffuses through it, but also how it has this cool surface look. So that's the technique that we use on the pool. This one will be done as green slime. Painting the base coat on the inside here and up to this first edge. <laughs> and then the liquid water the contents of the pool kind of goes up to you know, not all the way up here 
although it could, we could make it deep. We tend not to, uh, but it fills in the center part up to the bottom of this first wall. It's, I mean, it's just, it's a really cool effect. And it's, a, it's the centerpiece of the necromancy layer. We've done them, we've done them in green slime. We've done them in purple, because that's kind of a traditional necromancy color. And we've done one in red to represent like blood magic. decided that uh, the ones we're going to be doing what we call our production level kit sets are going to be green. Yes, between the stones so that I can minimize the touch up when it comes to doing that later. these part of this set the very rare floor tile without a wall attached just aren't very many of these except in the, in the very large sets I think the, uh, the dungeon of doom is almost all corridors and walls but the, the castle castle or the keep has a fair number of floor tiles including some that step up to a second level where the throne sits looking at the time here yeah I think I usually take a break midway through this eat drink yeah. so it, it looks like what I'll be able to do is get the base coat on all of these and wash the uh, door frames and that will be a good time to take a break because that'll give us then an extra 15 minutes or so for these to dry before I do the touching up. The touching up is just, I mean, they're just little dots all over the place and those dry very quickly. So depending on how that goes, I might even be able to start washing these today. And then on Wednesday, like I said, it looks like there's like 30 different pieces and tiles over there um, some of them are base coated in the blue the dark blue that we use that I've been using previously is the color of the, the tiles with the door frames we have run out of blue paint so I have to wait for that to arrive that won't be until Friday so I'll be doing base coating, and in some cases, there's scatter pieces like desks and chairs and things like that. So I'll be base coating the, the wood floors and stucco walls. Wednesday, and then doing some of the scatter pieces. Some of them are pretty cool. It'll be you know, it'll be kind of fun to tune in on on Wednesday just to see them. We've got desks and uh, cauldrons, boxes, um, there's some pillars, a bunch of doors. If we decide on the color scheme for the doors, I'll be painting those. Those are kind of you know, interesting and fun to do. 
little more detail work, get the little brushes out. Yeah, so I'll probably be doing a bunch of those, doing some base coating of wood floor and stucco wall tiles and doing scattered accent pieces and doors and the lintels over the doors. Hold them with toothpicks and paint them. So that'll be a little bit more interesting than than today because uh, there'll be different kind there'll be a bigger variety of pieces much about numbers or spatulas or things like that because uh, I can talk about what it is I'm painting here it's like oh I'm painting a wall made out of stone no, I'm painting a floor made out of stone. I'm not painting. Okay. No, I'm glad you did. Um, if you can't hang on any, until you know after the break, I understand. But I would encourage you to come back on Wednesday and see some of the more interesting things that we're that we're working on. And thank you for being a follower. Tell all of your friends and relatives to join in as well. I appreciate it. Grace and Dungeons. Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. 10 until 2 with a break in between more or less those times. Welcome, and please join in again whenever you can. Much appreciated. And yeah, if you got other folks you know who might appreciate it to enjoy this, let them know. Thanks again. See you again. Yeah, it's nice to have somebody new join in. Sometimes people join in and they're just sort of lurking in the background. But, you know, if you pop in on chat, since I have a screen with very large letters, as opposed to the one with little bitty letters over there, um, I can actually look up and read what's, what's going on in chat, which is... Two more of these. Single wall. Okay. The washing. The door frames that I painted last week, I mean Monday, and I lost track of where we are when I painted on Monday, the last stream. Um, yeah, and we'll get those done and they will look beautiful. Back to these tiles, these walls and floors, and then do a fair amount of touching up. All the spots where the paint didn't cover as well as I would like, either because I missed a spot or because the paint didn't get into the crevice deeply enough, or as it dried, it shrank a little bit and pulled away. 
well, these reasons why there is a flaw in the base coat. And I want to get like as close to perfect as I can. Um, I've never succeeded in that. There always seems to be a few that even after being touched up, when I do the wash, I see that there are spots that I missed the second and sometimes even the third go over. These basically the trick is to get it the paint down into the mortar lines. Looks at the spots that are most often missed and need the touching up. Once these are touched up, go through the process of painting accent blocks in a brownish color it's kind of with the gray it's kind of a yellowish brownish color and those get painted in in kind of a random way somewhere between like three and five on each block and then um, then the whole thing is washed in a gray wash to bring it alive and to highlight the uh, all of the uh, surface texture. The step process of building these things is printing them on the 3D printers that are behind me. Um, inserting the ball magnets in the base and attaching the little base plate. Priming them, base coating them, accent block painting them, and then washing them. <laughs> and after all of that has set up and they pass final inspection, um, they will get a protective coat uh, clear varnish. I'm not sure. I don't think it's actually varnish. I think it's more of a shellac. But it's um, it's a clear, it's, it's a matte clear coat that goes over the whole thing. That cuts down on the chipping and flaws that can happen through handling. <laughs> So this is the last one of the base coat gray tiles. You got too speedy here. There's a tendency. It's like the last one. Can I get it over with? And then wrote that well, but um, yeah, we'll take care on this one. Otherwise. You know, you either spend the time now or you spend even more time later fixing these things. Yes, who? I actually did a flip, but just for you, just for you, once I'm finished with this one tile here, which is the last of the base coat that I need to do before I do the touch up. I will do another flip. Even repeat the flip I did originally, which was with the cap of this paint bottle. And I will do that before I put the cap back on.
No, I know why I'm here today. I usually have like a cup of coffee in the morning, and I didn't this morning. And that's a wonderful appetite suppressant. And um, I didn't do that, so. I didn't feel like waking up this morning, so maybe I'll have a cup of coffee instead of uh, lunch because uh, I've been getting a little happy because it's hibernation time. It's, yeah, it's getting to be Christmas, Thanksgiving and Christmas. There's a lot of food around. It's not exactly all low calorie diet stuff, you know. <laughs> yep, I'll have a cup of coffee instead of instead of regular food for lunch. Okay. Those are base coated. Those there that I had painted on Monday are ready to be touched up. Those all over there are waiting to dry so that they can get their touch up. Flip. I did have its edge. <laughs> And yeah, yeah it, it's good. there we go. Did it again. Cool. So, oh, this up. Yeah, I'm saving for the touching up. Clean up this brush. Yes, I can. Yeah, a lot of touching up on these guys, so that'll take a while. And then I'll get the color out for the accent blocks and start painting those in. Okay, so there's this. And which brush? I need to use a little brush for the wash. I usually like to use a big brush for washing um, because it just makes it, it covers the surface area more quickly. It makes a uniform and wonderful things. But in this particular case, um, these door frames, These door frames are uh, small, and I need to get the wash on along these edges without getting it onto the other surface, because that wouldn't look good. I need to take these off so I can see close up, and I'm going to be using this stuff called smoky ink. Make sure it is well mixed. Because with these washes, there's a lot of salt and not very much pigment, and the pigment tends to settle. And unless it's really well mixed, um, the tendency is for the stuff on the top of the bottle to be very light, and the stuff near the bottom of the bottle to be very dark. Okay, so we will use a little palette here because I have to squeeze out drops of this stuff. And we'll see how I can do. Oh. Up. 
all around the tip of the top of the bottle there. There we go. Really interesting to when it first comes out, it looks kind of almost greenish, but uh, and it's really got quite a lot of red in it. So when you put it in this particular wood color, it lights the grain pattern. It also changes the color pretty noticeably. And it's a very, very nice wood color. It goes from what's really a pretty bland, dull brown to uh, almost like a mahogany. It's really pretty nice. The thing is, on a small surface, getting it uh, spread out. What I was trying not to do is to put it all over the adjacent surface. Oh, I just I just got a little impatient there. Usually washing is the part that goes really fast. But in this particular case, it's not going to because of what I'm thinking. I might do the same thing I did when I painted these with the base coat. No, that's not going to work. I was thinking I would be, I would just do the edges and then wash it later with a bigger brush, but. That would definitely not work on this surface because um, I, I would have dry wash down at the bottom, and it would uh, it would show bad unevenness. It would be it wouldn't look good. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to show you before and after here. This is what it looks like washed. And that's what it looked like not washed. And you can see that it just, it really makes it look very pretty. Very pretty wood. Especially it looks good on the wooden floors. The wood floor tiles. Some of which I will probably be working on next stream. I'm losing track of the days. I think I am. I think I kept talking about doing the next one on Wednesday, which would be like looping back in time. Get a duel or looping back in time this wouldn't be a bad thing. Even over yesterday, yesterday was a very difficult day for the dogs and for the people. I'm not sure. Their, their pressure or some just just an unpleasant day. Today seems to be going a little bit better, at least so far. The painting stream has been going okay. I've only made like one mess so far, which is pretty, pretty spectacularly good. to move off that surface onto this surface. Yeah. 
3D brushes, it doesn't, you can't really get it off but as well as you can with the big brush. And this stays nice and um, Came out okay. In front, because it's out of the way there. Kind of quiet here, trying to get the technique of washing with this small brush down. This is actually why when we do the stucco wall tiles. We do the washing of the base coat before painting the stucco so that you can use a bigger brush, you know, even if it means slapping the wash all over the, where the stucco wall is going to be, using the bigger brush just to get it more even, faster coverage and more even coverage. This is a little bit challenging. I think it's, you know, it's coming out okay. This wash, this particular wash is pretty forgiving. It's not exactly even. too little in the brush here. And I'm using it too much to spread it around on the other surfaces. Thank you. It's getting it down to the floor. A little streakiness with this brush, but actually it's working okay on this part of the door frame. There really isn't any wood grain texture on the print, and um, by making it a little bit streaky, it actually makes it look a little more um, grainy, wood grain. Didn't squeeze up too much of it there. I don't want it to dry up or gum up before I'm done. We'll see how this goes. It's a little slower than I was hoping. Okay, 
So there's uh, two of them. Just say when I'm painting door frames. Sorry about that. Easy to chat when you're just slapping paint, base coat paint on walls. But it's not as bad as painting a mini fig where you're using this like three bristle brush. And Trying to make micro dots or eyeballs and buttons and things. Spreading this, you know, it's starting to gum up on me. Put out about 10 times more than I needed. And then it goes bad before you can use it. Start losing the solvent in it too, and if it's, it's not just gummy, but it gets darker. So the application just looks a little trickier. So, unfortunately, well, we've got a whole bunch of bottles of this stuff coming. Being a little bit, but it's not fatal. Okay, three to one.
né? Four out of six. There's um, it's going back to uh, fractions and decimals. Two thirds. Two thirds sounds like pretty good progress. This is one of those where the percentages get a little bit awkward. 67 6666 six, six, six into infinity percent because you can't really legitimately say you're 68 percent done even though it's a lot closer to 68 percent than 67 percent and 67 percent doesn't sound all that much better than 65 percent so it's like two-thirds just just say two-thirds um, some fractions and decimals and things are just fractions and percentages just don't work out perceptually as well as others. It's like I would say uh, I'm three quarters done or I'm 75%. Three quarters actually sounds like you're further along than 75%, even though it's the same number. Because I think, you know, there's not much difference between three and four. That's like, it's only one fourth not done. So, you know, to say three fourths. Saying six eighths doesn't doesn't seem like it's quite as far because there's a bigger difference between six and eight than there is between three and four, and you know perceptually. So yeah, you almost have to have like seven eighths to feel you're far up. That's three fourths. Perceptual distance in the numbers is it's just an interesting thing. Okay, well, these are looking. These are looking actually pretty good. Two more left. The, the base coat on these just looks really sad without the wash. But it's a light enough color that it takes washes really quite well. Some of the other the darker brown colors look much better as a base coat. But the wash doesn't show on them as much and so you don't you don't pick up the texture of the wood grain that shows up in the print. If not, that's a lighter base coat with a darker well, shine it ends up looking the best. The 
the you have to be sure that your uh, covering with the launch pretty lot on. Because uh, any washed, unwashed spots will really pop out. So getting it on all the surfaces and getting it fairly even is... Uh, well, you have to do that anyway, even on the walls when there's large surfaces. Making sure you cover everything and that the coverage is fairly even. So when I finish these door frames, I'll be taking a break. I'm guessing it'll be a little bit longer break. It'll be something like maybe 20 minutes. Uh, just because I have a couple of things I need to check on and do. So I will not promise I'll be back in 15 minutes, but I will be back. Um, more or less around 20 minutes and what we'll be doing then is uh, fairly boring stuff we'll be doing touch-up on all the little spots that are not adequately covered and all those gray walls that i've been base coating we'll be using this brush and hooking little bits of gray paint at nooks and crannies, various and sundry spots all over the surfaces of um, those gray tiles. Because it looks, I don't know, they look pretty scabby. And the wash will help with some of it, but if the, the light color of the primer shows through it doesn't look very good. <laughs> so we're on our last one here. Beams ago, somebody in chat said that the will be right back screen was their favorite part of the stream. That wasn't much of a compliment, but um, I hope they're watching because in just a few minutes you'll be treated to the will be right back screen. And then you can watch that actually for a good long time. Whoever that was, I don't remember exactly who. Um, yeah, you really, you know, that's the part of the show that you enjoy the most. Will be coming up soon. Be sure you don't miss it. Just one more side of one more door frame.
with the wash left in the little well there, but it's really gumming up. We're finishing this just in time to use up what's left of the still usable wash. Okay, so what I will do is I'm going to give these a real quick, you know, right there, see, kind of missed a spot there. I'm going to give these a real quick inspection. Um, still got some wash left. Do any touching up that is essential. spots that are obviously missed. There's some places that are lighter and darker, but that's that's just the grain of the wood, so that's okay. Okay. So what we have here are these tiles ready for the doors to be installed. Probably on Friday, I will find myself, find myself painting doors. Between them and then, I will be finding out the color scheme is going to be for doors because all the wood doors are going to be alike and all the metal doors are going to be alike. They won't be like each other because some will be wood and some will be metal, but there. I think the wood doors will be simple. They'll be painted the same base coat with the same wash, so the wood is all consistent. Um, they have metal straps on them. I need to find out um, what color they want the metal straps to be because we have about seven different bubbles all the way from chrome shiny to practically black steel uh, metallic colors. So at the moment we are letting paint dry and then I'll be doing touch up and then I will be doing accent blocks. So, I'm going to push the break button and be back in somewhere in the 15 to 20 minute range. See you soon.
And we're back. Oh, and the camera focuses. All right. So moving right along with the uh, dungeon tiles here, we have a whole pile of initially base coated tiles. And they need touching up because after the first coat gets on, Sometimes there'll, there'll be spots here, like where I was holding it, or here, here. Um, sometimes just little nicks, sometimes places where the paint didn't get into the, the openings, or I just missed, like there. So what I need to do is uh, rotate this in all sorts of different directions, get some gray paint on my brush, 
you'd spend a fair amount of time just going around touching up spots with the gray paint. And so, yeah, this will take a while to get through all the touching up. And after they're touched up, mixing the paint here, after they're touched up, um, what we do then is paint the accent. So, for example, this one was done in a different base color. It's kind of bluish, grayish color. And then we paint anywhere from like three to five uh, little accent blocks on each one. And so that'll be the next step after the touch up is to do those. So, oops, opening this. Dipping in the brush and painting a whole lot of little spots. Not much fun to watch. Just watching a, a brush dip, dip in and out of paint, and you don't have to be real careful about it. It's the same color same bottle so we know that it will dry and then the spots will no longer be there and the touch-up will be invisible at this point uh, this doesn't use very much paint I'm just using up what's in the bottle cap first doesn't have to be absolutely perfect because we want some variation like when the wash is put on it be able to see some of the variation anyway but I especially want to get this the gaps mortar joints because I don't want those to show white and the, the wash even though it goes into those crevices is uh, translucent, almost transparent. And it will not completely cover all of them up. So I want to get the things I'm looking for, especially are the, uh, the gaps between the floor tiles down here that are not dark. And then like here, the mortar joint. Don't want white spots. Secret of touching up is to just rotate the piece in every single direction so something that's invisible in one orientation is glaring in another so you know do the best you can to catch them all and there's always some that get missed if it's really glaring if it's a really big chunk of something that's missing or got maybe even chipped off or whatever um, just, I've even done that. You just halt the uh, washing process and say it's got to be touched up. So you grab the base color paint and put it on, set that piece aside, and then come back to it. Hopefully, not very much longer away. Be and then uh, do the and then. If it's a tiny little spot in kind of an inconspicuous area that you're not likely to see, then sometimes you can just 
use the wash and So on the floor areas here, these little variations are fine. What I want to do is if there's like really shiny white spots, I mean, stone will have those anyway, so they don't look too bad at all. But I don't want any big ones or weird ones like little streaks or cuts. These little inside corner pillars are actually surprisingly hard to get base coated. And a part of it is just that they're hard to hold because you're holding onto this, so it's hard to hold it and rotate it at the same time. And part of it is that the mortar lines and the texture of the blocks is, is like deeper. On, on this print than it is on some of the other balls. But mainly it's just it's just uh, holding on to it there and then not being able to rotate and see all the angles while you're holding it. And as one is touching up, sometimes the, the paint is pretty shiny when it's first applied, when it's wet. Sometimes it's hard to tell if the spot is just a place that maybe hasn't been painted or whether it's a spot that's wet paint. This is this is pretty quick work. So, I mean, just you don't have to be even terribly accurate with the touch up. You just have to make sure you get it onto the spot that's not painted. You don't have to restrict it to just that because it's the same color. And here, what clearly happened is I put the base coat on. I was holding it on this corner and. Um, Paint didn't get where I was holding it. This is just, you know, the most difficult, if there is anything difficult about this, is just making sure, looking at it from all of the likely viewing angles and some of those that are even unlikely viewing angles to catch the spots that going through where the primer is showing through. And then no matter how careful you are, there's always something later. Later is later. These corners down there under the wall are the hardest to get to with the bigger brush. You can't, I mean, you can mush the bristles in there, but then it mushes up the brush too. So that's usually the most frequent place. And then like under here, very narrow gap. Again, it's hard for that larger brush to get in. But, you know, this is relaxing painting with dice and dungeons. And so, as long as there's no real time pressure deadline or something, I hope there isn't. It's not very arduous work.
I think the secret to minimizing these little spots is putting a lot of paint on the brush. And I just kind of discovered that these are some of the earlier ones. And I was, you know, being, trying to be conservative, trying to conserve paint. Can't get more, usually. But you don't want to waste it either. So I was trying to conserve paint and maybe didn't have enough paint on the brush or that might have been like one of the early ones before the brush got saturated. Anyway, sometimes that happens. This spot right there and the end seems to be a common area that doesn't get get painted. I'm not sure why, because it's easy enough to reach, but it's probably just the way I hold it and turn it. See, this is an example where there's just this tiny little spot, but if that weren't painted over, when, when the piece was finished, it would just shout out because the, uh, the wash probably wouldn't have covered it. Like this one here, you probably never even notice, or even this one. But some of them, some of them would definitely not look good once the, once the wash is put on. <clears throat> and once the wash is on, the only thing you can do is basically uh, repaint the thing. I think I actually had to do with one of the pores on the other on the blue set where the wash got on too heavy. So like if we missed a spot with the touch up and then had to retouch it because it was really conspicuous, would really actually need to rebase coat the entire wall, maybe even the entire um entire thing, the entire piece, and rewash it. So, we want to get, you see like here, that's pretty glaring, you know, that white spot there, but that's also very likely to catch a fair amount of wash, so that, that one probably wouldn't have shown very much. Okay, what I'm learning on this one is to look at it from the top. You know, I think I was doing that with the other ones, but I'll just, I'm going to give them a quick once over because that's the angle you most likely to look at it from. See there, there's one I missed there. I'm going to do that now that I'm thinking of these before I go on to the next cluster. It's easy enough just to give this a quick glance. Looking at you, looking at from top down. Okay, so that's, that's six, and now there's like a bundle of these. The ones furthest away from me are the ones I painted first. So those are the ones that are most dry. Touch up first.
I'm doing this touch up. There's not too much on these. I got better as I went along. Um, found that you need to have a lot of paint on the brush, and then you can't really do typical brushing, except right at like at the end, because uh, you need to work it down into all these nooks and crannies. So it's like pushing the paint down into the surface. And that's a technique that I will continue to use now that I'm learning it. Doesn't look much like painting, it's like smushing, but as it is, but that's what seems to work best. gloveless here. I'm likely to get my finger in the paint a little bit, but I'm not too worried about it at this point because everything is the same color. When I do the accent blocks, then I need to be much more cautious because if I touch an accent block, <laughs> the paint is wet, <laughs> and then touch somewhere else, there is suddenly accent block color everywhere you don't want it. And what happened here was that I just did not have enough paint on the brush when I was doing this. More spots, much lighter than I would like. I got in between the blocks pretty well. Yeah, these inside corners, I just, I just need to take more time with them. It's just, just the way they're held and rotated. It's the likelihood of problems, especially, you know, Holding, rotating it around, and then the last side of this pillar is hard to reach. Another super one's over, you know. More of those back where they were. And then I can redo them in reverse order again when I do accent blocks. just started to get better here as I learned things about this particular paint and what you needed to do to get it applied well. Inside of this round corner was done really quite well. And the outside just has a whole lot of spots then my guess is that just wasn't using enough paint here on the back. I was just trying to spread it too far.
Even if it's scary. Hey guys, D and D, thanks for joining in. We are doing relaxing touch up, getting the last. You know, after getting the the base coat, when you just look at the surface area and these little spots, like ninety nine point eight percent done. It's just the last fraction of a percentage where there's little flaws in the base coat, mainly um, on the very tippy top here, because that's just the way kind of. Uh, consequence of the way I hold the piece as I'm painting it. Once again, you get the, uh, is that a missed spot or is that just the shine from wet paint? So sometimes spots get painted more than once. On this, it's not a problem because they need to dry before accent blocks get put on anyway. And I have to fill the time on the stream, right? I mean, what better way to fill the time on the stream than putting tiny little dots of paint on spots that should have been painted earlier but weren't? Inside corners showing the same kind of issues. The other ones did. And to be honest, I'm not sure really exactly how to correct that first time around because there's no real good place to grab these things you know, except like that. And then the rotation is difficult, so that's why I attempt, I attempt to have per unit area, so to speak. Um, more issues with these than almost any others. And these are kind of, these are smaller areas too. So it's a little harder, you know, with a larger brush to brush the paint onto it without it pulling that. Anyway, we need to uh, try something different with inside corners, I think. <laughs> 
this touching up bit is kind of a relatively low skill but higher patience kind of job. Fine brushwork at all. It's just mainly finding all the spots and uh, dumping some paint on them in the adjacent areas. This is a this is a good uh, relaxing portion of relaxing painting. I'm finding it's also good to touch up your own work, because otherwise you'd be sitting here going and complaining about the, the lack of care and uh, skill of the original painter. See, like this whole side is, this looks like it probably it just got bumped or brushed against and it took the paint away. So yeah, I mean, if you weren't the one who originally painted this, you'd be grumbling about all the touch-up that you have to do, and how could they possibly have missed that spot? And, you know, it's like there's more unpainted than painted here, and then you get grumpy about your co-workers and the bad job that they do. And, But if you did your own base coat, there's no one to blame but yourself. And you can either, you can go, oh, geez, I really messed that up. What was I thinking? Or this is an opportunity for improvement, right? And it's always that. It's a learning experience. To improve the uh, preceding step. Or at least that's what you can tell yourself. But basically, you just screwed up. The pieces to this set. Uh, going to be going to be painting a large number of accent blocks, a number of walls. get a corner like that that looks like it sort of chipped doesn't it maybe it got bumped or something and the paint got knocked off my understanding is that to keep that from happening after these are finished you know kind of production level finish is that they'll be sprayed with a clear coat a matte clear coat to protect the, the painted surface We've tested that before. It looks, it actually looks pretty good. Um, doesn't add to the gloss at all, but it it actually helps emphasize some of the texture, really, even though it's clear. So it, it's not just a protectant, but it it actually uh, helps the appearance of the of the tiles, which is kind of neat. downsides of being on a stool many hours and being fairly old is that your legs start to cramp.
And I know these spots are really tiny and you probably, when you're looking at the stream, probably not even seeing them. So it looks like I'm just kind of uh, just uh, randomly just, you know, maybe not even really doing anything just to fill the time and make it pretend like I'm doing something in the stream. But no, I'm actually finding little spots. No, the paint didn't cover and the primer's showing through and I'm touching them up rubbing the base coat color onto them I used to have more often than not the camera closer to the work but what I found when I did that is that I would frequently move off camera. So <clears throat> it just gave it a wider field of view. Coming along. The printers are merrily singing away. I think there's, I know there's a filter on the microphone, so a lot of those those sounds um, you can't hear. Probably can't hear like the dogs barking either when they do when they go to it, which one was dying a while ago. But if you could, the 3D printers are quite melodic. Unless they zip their little print heads around. I suppose if I really paid attention, I could tell what was printing just by the sounds. But I haven't paid that much attention, so I can't. But that could be a skill that one could develop down here. Listening to the 3D printers is uh, just like identifying a bird by its song. You could identify the print by its song. Maybe we could do that. We could do a, a whole set. Of, that's an idea there. And there's an idea. I'm presenting an idea for this show. Is um, identify the print by its song. We could do like a training session where we did different prints and listen to their songs. And then uh, we could even do a contest. We could have like a, one of our D and D sessions, or the players from our D and D session listen and guess what what is that print based on the song it's singing. What's my line, or you know, what was the Groucho Marx one? Bet your life. Yeah, I mean, there. Got to attract an audience somehow. So there must be an audience for printer songs. It probably is. In fact, probably, well, I wouldn't doubt that somebody's already done this. If you have, uh, congratulations to you. It's because the printer makes all these different sounds as it's printing. So instead of designing a print for how it looks, I'm sure that somebody somewhere has designed a print for how it sounds. 
and maybe even gotten their printer to do simple songs like Happy Birthday or Jingle Bells or something like that um, with the design of the print. Okay, and now that I'm saying that, I'm guessing that Alexis or DM, <clears throat> the person who does all of the all the little design issue program things um, is either looking it up to see if anybody has done it and then deciding if not then she will because you know somebody has to or if somebody else does has you know, try to do it even better or increase the repertoire now we do have to be careful if you're going to teach your 3d printer how to sing a song is that it needs to either be an original score or something in the public domain because the last thing you want is to have your 3D printer sued for copyright infringement. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One is that 3D printers themselves make really bad witnesses, okay? I mean, you ask a 3D printer a question and you're, you're not likely to get a sensible answer. Um, 3D printers themselves don't really, I mean, I don't think so, but there might be some somewhere. Uh, the 3D printer doesn't really have any money, so they'd have a hard time hiring an attorney to defend them. And then they'd be stuck defending themselves, and then that goes back to number one, which is that you know, they can't really talk, so they can't defend themselves. And if they're in that situation, it could be pretty bad. So, I mean, one defense could be, this is a 3D printer, what does it know? Right? But, I don't know if that would hold up. Anyway, um, in order for the 3D printer not to get into copyright trouble, if you're going to teach your 3D printer how to sing a song, make sure that it's when in the public domain and that it's very clear that it's in the public domain. And here we've got three printers behind me. What's happening? And there's actually a fourth one somewhere. Not not right here, but it could be somewhere else. And, um, okay, four printers, what have you got? You got a barbershop quartet. So, I think, I think this is something. I think this is a thing. It's singing, singing 3D printers solos of harmonies, different rhythms, could do variations. Could do orchestral music. A little harder to do like pop music because I don't think a lot of that's in the public domain. But um, yeah. So if you're listening to this stream or watching it on YouTube either now or sometime on uh, YouTube after afterwards, you're just catching it or catching up with it, there is the next big thing. Composer. It'd be fun if you were a composer. You could, you know, because you can record tracks, right, differently. You could do like a sonata for 3D printers and strings or something. 
and then subcontract out the uh, 3D printer part to a uh, place like Dyson Dungeons that would provide you, um, you know, depending on how the contract is written, either either as an executive producer, we get like a share of the gross or something, or just a flat fee where we give up copyright rights. I'm sure Dyson Dungeons could be flexible in how it did that for your particular composition. Uh, but keep that in mind. That if we can get the singing printer thing going, that it could be an interesting addition to the instruments available to you when you write music. Anyway, if I'm real lucky, uh, Alexis isn't watching this particular stream, either now or on YouTube, and that won't, won't hurt me for creating, coming up with an idea, but, you know, just in case, if you are, feel free to contact Dyson Dungeons and encourage us to do what I just said. So I'm sure it would be pretty amazing. Yeah, well, we've got one more of these walls, and then I've got the pool. The pool is a little challenging touch-up, and we'll see why when I get to it. It was, it was difficult to paint to begin with, just because of the way the blocks appear in the print, and the spaces between them, uh, more so than these. Save that one for the end, but it will require a fair amount of work. What do we got? About a half hour left after this. Back down here, in terms of minutes, it's running fast. By about I don't know, five or six minutes or something, but it's also never fallen back. Yeah, so it's almost three on the clock, which means it's almost getting to two. Well, I am going to finish this touching up. And I think... Let's go over things real quickly. Um, in terms of what needs to be done. But I, I am going to work on doing some accent blocks because I want to see. I've got some here that are really quite nicely dry. I just want to see how it looks and make sure that it's still the color combination I definitely want to go with in the production. Okay, so the issue with this is that there's all these blocks around here. And there's this gap in between each one. And it was quite hard to get the brush into those. Um, spaces between the blocks. So be especially careful looking, rotating the work to look at it from any different thing. Sure that I got that done. If you look at them from one side and they look fine, you look at them from another direction and and they don't. So those are important because they're really visible. And although the wash will get in there, it won't totally cover the really bright color of the, the sand color of the primer. And we'll do that. And then we want to touch up the surface of these blocks. Uh, too many spots and as I go around doing more touching up I'm just almost certainly going to see flaws that need to be covered. The lower level here of the pool but the inside of the ring 
that was this was really hard to get to with the bigger brush so I'm going to rotate this and, and it has a lot of uh, texture to it plus the brush was like totally saturated with paint and as you can see it didn't cover all of it Too bad. I expected it actually to be worse when I was painting. I was just having trouble reaching it, so I thought there'd be a lot more than this, really. But it's not too bad. Part of it, I think, was uh, how I was holding it, too, and that the one side that was on the side I was holding probably was the one that was most uh, in need of touching on. rotating it just to look at the gaps here between these blocks and this angle. And then we'll look at it in this angle. Some spots that show up. And you're probably noticing that the outside of the ring needs some work, and that is true. So that's the last bit I'll do here, is the outside of the ring. Reaching into the little crevices to make sure that there's paint there. are getting active. Running around, probably need to go out. They're around like five and a half months old now. They just had their spade last week, and they're just a week ago tomorrow. So they've been enforced limited activity okay so they're five and a half month old puppies and they're being told you can't run or jump or play with each other other than by you know gently nuzzling so you, you probably get a pretty good idea of how well that it is going well but it's just a lot of monitoring and sometimes some mm, sort of intervention they need last night they needed to be separated from each other because they're healing you know and they're feeling better there isn't any pain the scars don't even itch much anymore they just want to go and they did and we have to give them a little time out from each other you know a little quiet crate time gave them a treat put them in the crate covered it up to reduce their stimulation and that worked, but uh, it's getting harder and harder as they are getting healthier and ready for risk. So uh, that's the touching up. And let's cap this up. Got my glasses in a minute so I can see the clock on my computer. Yep, 127. Okay. So yeah, this clock is exactly 55 minutes past.
No, sorry, it's 65 minutes fast. 65 minutes fast because it's uh, five minutes on the hour plus an hour. And someday I keep saying I'm going to get up on a stool or a little step ladder and take it down and change the battery and fix the time, but then I don't. So what's next? What's next is I will be taking these locks, like this one. This is a cut stone and the other base color. And I'll be taking the accent color, which is not quite this. It's a little yellower and it goes better with the gray. Um, and picking out three to five on each wall and painting the block in. The, the things that take skill here are kind of picking them out so they look random but also balanced on the wall and making sure that get the same block on both sides because somebody will be paying attention to that and say okay this this block is brown but on this side this one is brown not the one that you painted what's up with that colors of blocks don't migrate from front to back so uh yeah i will be these six were done earlier and see how many of those i can get done um this paint is very rarely used and so I can look at the bottle and see that the pigments really settled out of this. So bear with me, this is going to be probably the better part of two minutes of vibration as I rotate this bottle and everything else on the table vibrates so as we get really stirred. For those of you who haven't seen it, this thing, there's a rubber cup on the top that rotates, not in a smooth way, and it takes uh, up the contents of the bottle really well. With the stuff in the bottle, like this Tamiya paint, you can stir it. When it settles like that, you can get a, like a stick into it into a popsicle stick sort of thing and stir it from the bottom which is pretty effective uh, with the uh, Vallejos that come in these squeeze bottles you can't get anything in there so this machine has really been effective with that otherwise you're sitting here trying to do it by shaking it and it just it takes forever compared to the kind of mixing you can get with this loud and vibrating. So let's, I'm bored with that. And my hand is tired of being vibrated. So we'll open this. Yeah, that hasn't been opened in a while, but it had been at one point and paint got on the screw threads, right? So you can see how it's dried on there. And that's why it was sticking. So there's this color. This color by itself, I have to say, actually looks really ugly. I really don't like it. It's kind of gross. But um, when it's applied to this and it dries, and it's washed it looks pretty nice it's doing three up just feeling a little lazy about it So marking it on the back, right? Just marking the blocks that are going to get painted.
here that the ones on the other side are the same as the ones on this side. I was really surprised that the hair or dust or something lint. You call it lint. Mm -hmm. This paint is, it looks orangey. I mean, it's really, and it's not a pleasant orange. It's not a bright orange or anything. It's just kind of an ugly color. Uh, but surprisingly so, that, uh, especially after it's washed, it looks really, really good against the gray. The darker color that we used with the blue background, this doesn't look as good. So we, we practiced with the uh, different base coat colors and different accent colors and then different washes on both. We looked at like 10 different combinations of things, a whole lot of different combinations and reached a consensus amongst the owners of Dice and Dungeon, one of the partnership. these color combos. And you can see, even there, even now at this, like, you can't see too much, but this looks really orangey. But when it's against the, the gray, then it starts to dry, it tones it down. And it's a little bit transparent, just a little bit. And, then, and that actually helps when you wash it, because it picks up the uh, the variation in the color a little better then. It makes it look a little bit more like stone, natural stone, than if it were like totally opaque. Sounding altogether unhappy. I'm guessing she got left alone in her room. Maybe even separated from the other dog if they were being bad. But yeah, managing puppy behavior right now is they're starting to feel much better physically after their surgery last week. But they still, you know, have to have restricted activity because we don't want them to hurt their incisions, which are mostly but not entirely healed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we're trying to be cautious that way, but they're, they're not happy about it. These outside corners always take a little longer because effectively there are two walls, not just one. So they take, um, they take as much time as two single wall tiles would take. And they're also a little challenging because on the, on the inside, Sometimes it's, it's sometimes it's just hard to reach. Um, yeah, I almost stuck my fingers in it. Great. Sometimes it's just hard to reach some of the spots. This direction, it's not too bad. But when I flip this over and bring the paint back the other way, uh, what we'll find is that this wall is in the way of reaching down with the brush. In this set, 
<clears throat> it's like a diabolical number of corners. It's like it's all there is is one corner after the other. It's not like they're, you know, terribly hard to do or anything. It's just, just need to be a little bit more cautious, a little slower, a little more careful. That's the word. You just need to be a little bit more careful uh, at this stage of the game, because at each step, touching up something from the preceding step just gets a little bit harder and sometimes you just have to redo the whole thing and I would prefer not to so as we flip this around you can see that you know reaching down can't really brush horizontally against it. it's more vertical and that just requires a little bit more care so I just I wanted to do a couple of these before we ended the stream today just to show you what the next steps would be, uh, but also to make sure before I do too many that after they're inspected, we are, since this is the first time we've really done a production level volume with this color combination, I want to make sure that everybody's happy with it. And if not happy, at least satisfied. What I learned too is that, again, you can't use the holder on this thing, so I need to hold it. And you'd think I could just grab it there, but that isn't what I do for some reason. Is that painting the blocks on the surface first works pretty well. And then I tend not to hold it on the top very much, but I do on the sides. So the last thing I do are the edges. But the other thing is, um, some of you might have noticed that I didn't paint the outside of this block. Great. So you, you do you do pick these things up after a while is uh, you know check it twice. Make sure you're not missing something obvious like an entire side of a wall before moving on. And that dive is pretty close to doing. I was just so thrilled at having one of the one of the walls done that I um, started to ignore the fact that there are two walls here instead of one. Used up the paint in the bottle cap pretty well, so we move on to using it in the bottle. Whenever I just you know, grew up, when you're never really sure when you could get more of something you know when you're doing something like building models which was not not an essential life activity you know, to not waste stuff so i tend to get you know, not maybe a little too careful with the amount of paint that i use so i use the paint in the bottle cap first it doesn't make sense to waste that yeah the other thing about using the paint in the bottle cap is uh Remember how I told you how I don't touch the top? It was a lie. Is that it? The paint in the bottle cap is the stuff that tends to gum up the. Um, sometimes, if you get this stuff early, you can wipe it off and have to uh, retouch it. But in this case, it's a little late. So, and I've got it on my finger, and I'm getting it everywhere. So, what you're going to see me do today? is after I finish these blocks, these accent blocks on this one, is you're going to see me paint up, pull out the gray paint and touch up this mess that I just made uh, before going on to anything else. Yeah, 
Yeah, this tends to happen near the end of the stream. Hmm. Stone, and then get a little bit careless, and then one little bit of carelessness leads to another little bit. But this is painting, and even as the old masters can tell you, one nice thing about painting is that you can paint over something you didn't like, like either a fingerprint or you know, an entire character in a painting. Like you, you painted in um, the sponsor of your work, you know, the person who is paying you, your patron. You painted your patron into your piece. And then your patron came along and said, I don't like that, and was a real jerk about it, and decided not to pay you the money that uh, he, it was probably a he, back then, um, you know, promised to pay you, and then you get ticked off, and, well, you know, they're painted in, what can you do about it? Well, what you can do about it is you just paint them out. <laughs> so, yeah, you can always fix paint. So I'm going to um, just mix this up a little bit. And we have another brush with bristles almost the same size, but it's not quite as good a brush. It's all worn out, but it's good enough to um, fix these spots that I made. And in the process, touch up the spots that I failed to touch up when I did touch up. So we're going to do this. Okay, so I think I fixed that. So this is what it looks like with, um, with the accent blocks painted in. And that color actually goes pretty well with the gray and when it's washed, it looks really quite nice. Uh, there's a little bit of time left here, so I'm going to... Maybe it's a little late because we start a little late. I'm going to do another corner because... Just, they got to be done. Grab the other side. Do a chunk of three here, and then just one. This one says I need to be done. Sometimes a little, a little cluster of like three, three blocks looks pretty decent. It's a little bare on the back. Um, like here would be nice, but yeah, let's do that. It'll look good when it's done. We'll certainly fill the time, because there's quite a lot of them that need to be painted.
Here is I'm trying to finish up this corner. This for some reason mark 1% more. I just marked more more blocks than I really needed to. I did that triple thing there and uh, it just looked out of balance, especially on the back. grab one, you know, kind of at random, and then try to make it look, you know, haphazard, so it's not just like planned, kind of. I'm not trying to make a design with these things and the bricks in the blocks, but you want it to look uh, balanced, you don't want it to look awkward. But, oh, at least that's how I pick them. And so I'll grab one and then sometimes I'll say, well, I want to do a diagonal here. So you do that and then say, well, I need something running in the other direction to balance it. So uh, that's how these blocks get picked. That's how that one got done because this one got done. Those got done first and then it looked out of balance without something down in that corner. Look at this up close and see that there's a little bit of a cheat going on in that I'm pretty much painting just the surface of the block and then it doesn't go down all the way on the sides because that becomes next to impossible to pull off without making a real mess. But you get the impression of these. Sometimes it's the, the impression it leaves rather than the, the specific detail, you know. Because we're not, we're not painting like a set piece model or painting a thing that you want to use in your production and you want to look good to the players and if you're streaming you want to look good to people watching the stream. So we found <clears throat> through our own use this is takes a reasonable amount of time to do, can be done with some accuracy and ends up looking good. It's the, the five on the other wall, which I need to forget this time. And that will be what we'll get done today. So to recap, what was accomplished today is I finished base coating all of these walls that had been primed in the gray color. I touched them up and I am showing at least sort of a demonstration of what it looks like with the accent blocks put up. I also managed to uh, put the wash on the door frames that I had painted on Monday. The door frames for sets that had already been, <clears throat> been painted and washed. And we just, the door frames were decided to be wood and not the, the kind of stone that the rest of us made out. So I painted the wood base coat on Monday and put the wash on today. 
and what I will be doing on Friday. Assuming, not entirely sure, but usually we do Fridays as well. Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays from 10 until 2, relaxing painting with Dyson Dungeons. Be there or be square. Yeah, I really said that. Um, is I am going to be finishing up all the accent blocks on all of these other tiles, and there are many of them. Demonstrating again how they work together, because it's a really cool thing. And then, depending on how the drying is going, because I don't want to wash when the paint is still wet, because all it does is it mushes it around and it just gets really messy really quickly. I want to make sure that not just the gray base coat, but also the accent tiles are fully dry. Um, uh, then start doing the washing. Be using the same color uh, gray wash that we used on the blue tiles. But because the base coat is different, it actually looks quite different on these. So there's a couple of uh, blue ones that are still accessible. I'm going to get around to washing, which is more likely than not going to be next week, Monday, because I want these to be dry. Um, we'll see not only the washing process, but also we can do a compare and contrast then with a completed gray wall versus a completed blue wall. Let's see the, the difference in color and the impression that they give. Um, yeah, so on Friday, depending on how much time is left after I paint many, many walls of accent blocks. Um, we'll start working on some of those pieces that were just primed. <coughs> There's wooden floor and stucco wall pieces. They're scattered, like desks and barrels and chests and things. Just a lot of really cool stuff that can uh, that'll be more interesting to watch, probably than some of this. It's pretty likely that I'll get to some of that on Friday. Okay, we'll just paint the top here. But most of the first, certainly the first half of the stream before the break is going to be doing accent blocks on these tiles. And then, like I said, those will be set aside so that they're thoroughly dry when we start washing on Monday. And then I'll be working on a bunch of miscellaneous pieces from our recently primed pile. And try to find some that maybe use the same colors so that it's a little more efficient. Just like all the wooden stuff. <clears throat> and uh, yeah. So here we are. Almost exactly right on time. With the wrapping up of relaxing painting with Dyson Dungeons on Wednesday. So I want to thank everybody who is watching either this live stream and I also want to thank those who will watch it later on YouTube. Thanks for joining in. Um, oh, right at the end. It's gone. So I have to touch that up before we finish because I just... That's what happens right at the end. Um, yeah, feel free to follow. Tell your friends and family that they should join in because it's really cool to watch us do painting. And then um, if you really would like to, I will make a plug for our Patreon. Patreon.com slash Dice and Dungeons. And 
that way you can support not only this wonderful relaxing painting stream but also our dungeons and dragons campaign well that was almost a huge mistake that's the base coat for the other ones got so used to opening that got so used to opening that that i almost used it items no, I just need to find where I made that mess. Mm -hmm. and if I can't find it, I guess it just wasn't a mess, was it? But I thought I slapped paint. I thought I slapped paint onto some place I didn't want it. I guess it was here. I mean, it's such a tiny little thing. Yeah, right near the end, I messed up with the brush and almost grabbed the wrong color paint. That would have been an interesting touch-up issue. Okay, so I got all the blocks on both sides. That's what I was checking. Okay, so. Here are two. Count them two uh, corners. Let the accent blocks paint it in. Set those into the. These are almost done pile. We use the next guys to get done pile. And thank you all again for uh, watching the stream. Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, 10 until 2. Uh, with a break in between there somewhere in that time range and you'll be watching us do dungeon tiles on friday doing more blocks and then also starting to work on a whole range of miscellaneous other things uh, wooden floors those come out really cool maybe a stucco wall or two i can't really see from here but i see some floors um and then, uh, yeah, some of the uh, the accent things like doors that need to be done, lintels that go across the tops of the doors, those need to be done. Just a whole bunch of little stuff that takes a little bit of time that I will be able to finish. So I'll be doing some brown with wash on Friday. Okay, take those brushes there. Take this brush, it's always important to try try to clean your brush. Okay, this is interesting. This brush, Nikki bought this, was a fairly expensive brush um, and really hasn't held up this well. This brush, same sort of tip on it, uh, is something like 20 years old. It seems to be holding up really quite well. So, you know, what can I say? It works for me. Okay, so this guy is holding on to some paint there. Yeah, I think what's different is that these bristles are a different com composition and they hold the paint, which is actually really good because then you can saturate the brush, you know, as you're painting and it spreads the paint out better. But, um, for some reason, it curled on the end. And the bristles just, they're not holding together on the tip and it curled. Anyway, it's good for touch up. Uh, yeah, that's it. Um, these are your non accent blocked ones, and that's your accent blocked ones. That's how they look when they're together. These will all have accent blocks. And I will. See you on Friday at 10, more or less. Thanks for joining in, and we'll see you then.